guest tonight. Um, my special guest this evening is Robert Sullivan IV. And Robert W. Sullivan IV is a philosopher, historian, antiquarian, jurist, mystic, lay theologian, theologian, radio TV personality, writer, lawyer, and the best-selling author of the books The Royal Arch of Enoch, The Impact of Masonic Ritual, Philosophy, and Symbolism that was published in 2012, republished in 2016, and Cinema Symbolism, A Guide to Esoteric Imagery in Popular Movies, 2014, republished in 2017. His third book is Cinema Symbolism 2, More Esoteric Imagery from Popular Movies, is available for purchase on Amazon.com, released in 2017, and uh, Sullivan is writing his first work of fiction and is also working on another book on masonry titled Freemasonry and the Path to Babylon, as well as a work of fiction, A Pact with the Devil. And that's available now. It just went live for purchase on Amazon and at your local favorite local bookstore. We're going to get into that tonight. Mr. Sullivan is a Freemason, having joined Amicable St. John's Lodge 25. Baltimore, Maryland in 1997. He became a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason in 1999, Valley of Baltimore, Orient of Maryland, a lifelong Marylander. He resides in Baltimore. And his website is Robert Sullivan. The fourth.com and that's that's IV. All right, everybody. So please welcome Robert to the show this evening. Good evening. Hey, so Lars, thanks for having me on. Much appreciated. Uh, great introduction as always. Well, thank you. It's always a pleasure to have you on board with us. I'll tell you what, you're the busiest man I know with all your books <laughs> cranked out. And congratulations. So now it is official. Your your book, A Pact with the Devil, is actually live. Yes, you can actually um, the print edition came out on Tuesday, uh, December 5th. And yeah, you can get the print edition. I know it's up on Amazon and I know it's mm -hmm. up on Barnes and Noble. It usually takes like a week or so for it to really filter into the system. So I know it's, it's not everywhere yet, but it's getting there. Um, and that's the print edition. You can get that now. The ebook, uh, the Kindle, the Nook, that's still probably like two, three weeks away. Sweet. But um, yeah, but the print edition, yeah, that's it. It's up. Uh, so, Excellent. Uh, yeah, well, I haven't so. read it yet, obviously, but I'll tell you what, it's on my list and I'm going to be reading it and then I'm going to have to drill you big time, but I can't wait. And I did see it on Amazon, so I'm very, very excited that it's ready to roll. And I encourage everybody, actually, this is make, this would make a really nice stocking stuffer too. So I would encourage everybody to purchase a copy. Yeah, no, I was, uh, you know, I mean, it was one of those things where like, you know, you just, it was another book and I kind of believe it was done and uh, I was real happy with the way it turned out. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens with it. It's my first work of fiction. So, um, you know, I, the other three are, you know, more like, uh, learn, you know, tech, you know, like text almost, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you know, inf informative. Uh, right. But this was this was I mean, you know, you try to make them interesting. You make them fun to read for any book you write. But this work was uh, total fiction. It came to me in a dream many years ago. Now, it's hard to believe it's been almost uh, over four and a half years since uh, I, I dreamt this thing. Wow. Uh, yeah, it, it was a long time in coming because uh, the the dream occurred. It's actually I, I know the dream date because it's actually in the book, um, but it was April of 2013. And when I dreamt it, I was actually in the middle of writing the first movie book, Cinema Symbolism. So so when I when I dreamt it, I started making notes with it at first and just outlining it. But then I started writing it more in earnest. And but I was really concentrating on the the first cinema book, which as you said, originally came out in, in, in the summer of 14, it was later republished. Um, but, but then I was doing Pact with the Devil on the side. And then I started writing Cinema Symbolism too. And I, again, again, it was always sort of like a side project, but I, but I was working on it. And I remember uh, writing Cinema Symbolism too and Pact with the Devil kind of concurrently, but I, I reached a point in time where uh, it was too much. Um, it was too much flip-flopping back and forth between the two books. Uh, I couldn't, you know, you couldn't recall what you had left out or what you, where, where you were. You constantly, I was constantly going back and having to reread. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, I thought at that point, I thought, let me just put Pact with the Devil on the shelf and let me just finish Cinema Symbolism too. And uh, I, I eventually, uh, you know, got that out. And, and while this was all going on, um, this was last year, this was at, at the end of the summer of last year, um, I actually had to republish Royal Arch and Cinema Symbolism. So that kind of delayed everything once more. But I got Cinema, Symbol Cinema Symbolism 2 out, and that's when I sort of, you know, really could sit down and just went for, you know, full thrust into a pact with the devil, which, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I got it back from the editor in October and, uh, you know, it came out on Tuesday. So, you know, there yeah. it is. Yeah, and congratulations, I will say. Yeah. And, and for anybody who's interested in, in this type of thing, I would say it's kind of like it is a, a mystery and a, is it a murder mystery or well, right. how would you classify it? Okay. Right. That's that's what I would call it at, at its heart and soul is a murder mystery. Um, I mean, it has horror elements. It has supernatural elements. 
it, it has a, you know, uh, it has some erotica in it. But, um, yeah, I mean, I would call it its heart and soul a murder mystery. Um, it, it's divide. The book is actually it, it's a concurrent storyline. Um, there's no flashbacks or flash forwards. It, it takes place, you know, in, in a storyline that starts and moves forward. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's divided into two halves. Um, I, I don't. I mean, they, they overlap, of course. I mean, they 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 have something to do with each other. Um, and I, I would I, I divide it into two halves. Called, uh, the, of course, the first half is the sacred feminine, and then the second half is the divine masculine. And uh, um, what, what the first half is about is is this this sort of you know this witch's coven. In, it takes place in modern day London. Um, it takes place. It, it, it opens up in 2001 on, on September 11th. I don't. I don't want to give mm. that away. Um, but it, it opens up in modern day uh, England, London. Uh, it, well, it starts in Oxford University, um, and then it moves to London very quickly. And it, it's about this uh, group of witches uh, that that make this pact. It's actually not the devil. Um, it's a high ranking demon uh, called Lucifuge Rofacal. It's a real mm. demon. Um, mm-hmm. I, I couldn't call it a pact with Lucifuge. It just didn't work. Um, so, so they make this pact for fame and fortune and, uh, it has some conspiratorial elements in it and it has, uh, you know, this, this, this pact, of, uh, this group of witches, you know, what's going on with them. And, uh, one of them, uh, I don't want to give it away, but one of them winds up murdered. And, mm. uh, the second half is the investigation into what happened to her. Uh, but they overlap, uh, the, 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 the two halves. Um, of course, intertie with each other. And, uh, you know, like I said, the whole the whole story, this whole this whole plot um, just came to me in a dream. And, mm. uh, you know, like I said, I, 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 I wrote it down. I remember, you know, making a lo- loads of notes about it. And um, I, I just really liked the story. And uh, I I've never written. I, I had no really intention of writing a work of fiction when I started out doing all this with the Royal Arch and Cinema Symbolism. Uh, but but I liked I liked the story and I I, I just thought it was interesting characters, and uh, I, I was real happy with the way the 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 the, the story came out, um, and uh, yeah, like I said, you know you can get it right now, and uh, the ebooks are still probably about two three weeks away, um, and I, I usually the way it works for me is I, I usually like to let the uh, paperback kind of get into the system. Mm-hmm. It's, it, you know what I mean? Uh, I know oh, it's on, yeah. yeah, I know it's on Amazon. I know it's on Barnes and Noble, but you know, there's a lot of overseas sites. It's got to be set up on. I know it's not on books a million yet. So, you know, it usually takes about a week or so, um, to fully get into, you know, you know, where, where it's everywhere. And then I'll get it underway for the ebook conversion. Um, but like I said, that's still probably two, two, three weeks away. Um, but yeah, if, if you want the paperback, uh, it's on Amazon. Like you said, it makes a great mm-hmm. Christmas gift or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or stocking stuff or whatever. And, and you know, in all my books, I like to think through. So yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it's there on Amazon. Yeah, it's perfect. I saw it. I already ready to read it and everything else. So I can't wait, but I will be, um, obviously you'll be back. You're always back anyway, because I always have you on as a, as my, almost a continuous guest. So yeah. definitely, um, I can't wait to read this book. And you know what I was, I found interesting and I know we're not going to talk about it tonight, but the September 11th, 2001, that's very interesting. And, and the spirit associated, I suspect. So, um, well, I'm not going to, we won't get into that tonight, but well, it, it seems to me like, I'll talk to a little bit about it. Okay. Uh, no, it was, um, it, it, there, there was, yeah, it, this was just a fascinating aspect of it. Um, there is a ghost of a person. I'm not going to identify which one of someone who was from Baltimore, who actually, um, is, is, it's her, her ghost is in the story. It was a real victim. Um, uh, since the person is no longer alive, it's not defamation or anything like that. And it's a minor character anyway. Um, and she sort of serves as this, uh, intermediary, um, uh, in between sort of the uh, ghostly world and the demon and some of this afterlife uh, issues going on and sort of sort of this inter- intermediary between these witches and this demon. And it was a really interesting interplay um, ha- having someone, uh, you know, you know, I-, I was just really intrigued with using uh, the spirit of someone who, who had passed away on 9-11. It was that way in the dream. And I don't know wh- why it was. Um, wow. But it was uh, it, it really plays out interesting because the story the story opens uh, on that date, um, but then it moves f- forward immediately. Um, it ju- it jumps forward to it, it, I want to say around uh, eight nine years uh, later uh, with this with this with these witches. Uh, it starts when they're in college at, at Oxford University at Christchurch, and um, 
it, it also gets into the idea of how this 9-11, you know, there's, of course, this interplay with how the 9-11 ghost spirit, um, you know, you know, the, the world has moved on and, you know, is somewhat, you know, confused about certain things going on in 2000. 8, 2000, you know, 12, 13, that wasn't around in 2001. So um, I just thought it worked, it, it worked really well. I, I really enjoyed uh, this interplay um, between, between the witches and, and the spirit. And, uh, um, you know, and then there's other characters that turn up as well. It, it has a lot of uh, characters in it. I've, I, you know, it was the one thing where when I remember uh, going back to reading, I thought, God, there, there really is a lot of people in this. But I, th I think it, I kept it pretty orderly. And, uh, you know, I think, it, I mean, it reads forward. Um, it, it's, it, it, there's no flashbacks or flash forwards. Um, I mean, it's, it's a linear storyline. Uh, and, and the one thing that, you know, I didn't want to do was leave like a cliffhanger. Um, I'm planning a sequel to it. I've already started outlining it, actually. But the, 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 the story ends. Um, I mean, you will definitely get a conclusion to this story. Um, you know, the, the mystery will be solved. There's not like, oh, you know, I left you hanging for a sequel or something like that. I mean, you will definitely get a definitive answer as to who, you know, who's behind or, or who or what is behind this, this person's death. Um, and the way I did it was, uh, then, then, then the, 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 that comes to an end. And then the, la the last two chapters of the book, uh, really served to set up the sequel. Um, that, that's the way I ended it. So, nice. yeah. Yeah, that that you know, I, I I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to leave it out there as a cliffhanger, or you didn't know what was going on, or I was going to save it for you know another story. I mean, you will definitely get a definitive end to this one, and then the last two chapters of, of the story really served to set up uh, the sequel, which I'm working on. And then when I was writing this, I'll just end it on this. When I was doing this, um, I started. I've already started writing it. There's. Um, uh, I, I'm also going to create this. Uh, I'm working on creating a, a sort of sub story um, with all this. Uh, the, the one with the witch's coven that these w women are involved with, the, the main one is called the Black Flame. Um, mm. And uh, I'm, I'm working on something called Tales from the Black Flame, which is going to be like a series that ties into the main storyline, but serves as like a backdrop. So I've already started writing the uh, first one of these called Tales from the Black Flame. Which, which I'm re really happy with the way this is turning out. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I've got I've got multiple books that I'm working on right now. Cool. Um, yeah. yeah. Congratulations. So. Yeah, I love it. Well, I think we touched on this before on a previous show on hyperspace, but we touched on, it seemed like you streamed a lot of this data, meaning it just kind of came in from whatever aspect of your multidimensional design. And I liked, I do like the um, the idea of the spirit mediating between the demon and the witches, or at least it appears that way. So that's yeah. going to be very, very interesting. And also, you know, with all the decoding you do, with your books, I, I have to say that I'm pretty sure that I. This is why I'm looking forward to reading it because I'm sure that there is not only symbolism, but there's there's codes in there even if you didn't consciously put them in. Oh no, you're you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll two, there are two things. Yeah, the the the, the spirit is um, a very interesting element of it. Um, I was real careful with it because I didn't want to make it look like the spirit was you know um, being tormented or anything like that. It was more mm -hmm. of like a an assignment almost. Right. Um, you know, and I was very careful with that because actually later in the she winds up sort of acting as this intermediary between this demon and the living. And uh, that's how it opens up. But then later on, as the story progresses, she actually winds up saying, hey, I'm doing some other work for some angels and stuff like that. So um, and she, she kind of like helps them out and talks to them and um, gives them hints. Of course, they don't pay any attention to her. Um, she can be a pain in the neck for, for them. And, 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 mm -hmm. you, you know, if you read the story. But, yeah, I, I absolutely um I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because I, I do incorporate um, when I was doing writing Royal Arch of Enoch that has some codes in it and some mysteries in it and cinema symbolism. The first one does when I did cinema symbolism too. Um, at, at the end of the introduction, uh, if you read cinema symbolism too, I actually, this was the first place where I actually alerted the reader. I said, if you're reading my material and you're reading this book or you've read my past book or you read any of my future books, pay attention. Cause I do incorporate codes um, some hidden uh, imagery in the books. Um, I believe some of it could be subconscious. There is some conscious that I'm doing, and, and this is absolutely true in Pact with the Devil. Um, there is a uh, component in it. Um, oh, I don't want to give the story away, but there is some repetition in the book. Um, it's very it's very well hidden. Some of it is not, um, but, but there is a little bit of repetition in it. That, that, that I'm, I was trying to reinforce an element of the book, but I can't say what that element is just yet because I don't want to give the whole story, whole story away. But yeah, the, 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 
the I, I totally agree with you. Um, there are uh, codes uh, and hidden meanings in the book. Some of them, I, I, I could tell the, the listening audience, I have placed in there intentionally. But yeah, you know, with, with a pact with the devil, like you said, this was kind of streamed to me. Uh, this whole story came to me in a dream. Uh, you wonder if, you know, there, there was some sort of hidden meaning or, or something in, in this uh, that I'm not even aware of. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I mean, that that story was completely given to me in a dream. And like I said, you know, to be completely honest, um, this was not something I had really intended on doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was I had, you know, Royal Arch had come out. I was working on cinema symbolism, too. And I just had this vast dream of the story uh, that I was very taken with. Um, and I liked it. I thought it was interesting. And uh, I turned it into a work of fiction. And uh, yeah, so, so yeah, you're absolutely correct. There is some of it conscious on me that I do. Um, but some of it probably is unconscious as well. Collective unconscious, mm-hmm. I suppose. Right. Yeah. And that's why I'm looking forward to reading it. So um, I do have it in my little list and now I'm going to be reading your book. So I'm very, very excited. So once again, everybody purchased the book. I saw it on Amazon. Great price. Um, it's perfect for a gift. I just love it. So we have a question in the chat here from Olive. Hi, Olive. It says, um, can you ask Robert, why did this take place in Oxford University, England with demons and witches? And could could it have taken place in another place? Yeah, no. Um, well, like I said, this was the way it was in the dream. Um, mm-hmm. It's a good question. Um, I, you have to wonder if, you know, I, I assume um, some of this some of this has to do with my own life, um, you know, things that I'm familiar with. Uh, so, for instance, um, I was a student at Oxford University, so I'm sure uh, I, I spent my junior year abroad there. Now, I never matriculated, but I, I was there. So I'm sure that probably had some element of, of why it was set there. That's the way it was in the dream. Mm-hmm. Um, and it made it very convenient because... Um, uh, the, the, you know, I'm familiar with it. I'm familiar with the layout. And what, what was interesting was, um, when, when I was over there, uh, when I was over there, this was 1992, 93, and then again in 95, um, what, one of the places that I, I wound up uh, visiting and I was just really taken with is the cemetery in London called Highgate Cemetery. Um, mm. and it's this very overgrown Victorian, um, cemetery. It, it's very Gothic. It's, it's very, it's very mysterious. Mm. Um, it's from the 19th century. It's all overgrown. It has the Egyptian imagery in it, um, but it's overgrown. In, in the early 1970s, it was terrorized by a vampire. Um, people were turning over graves. It's been the site of satanic, um, you know, uh, rituals and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a, if you ever have a chance to go to London, by all means, take a visit of Highgate Cemetery. Mm. Um, it, it's, it's a fascinating. It's a fascinating burial ground. And um, the, the story opens at Oxford, but it actually moves to Highgate, um, which, was, which is where they live. Um, mm-hmm. and, and the cemetery factors in into the dream. And then, a, again, another place that it's set is the Maryland Historical Society. There's a scene that takes place there. Uh, there's a scene that takes place uh, in a bar here in downtown Baltimore called Mother's Federal Hill Grill. Uh, that's a place that I, I frequent from time to time. So, I'm, you know, the, the fact that, you know, it's, it's me writing it. Um, and it was a dream. I'm sure that, you know, the, the, the familiarity with these things filtered into it, um, mm-hmm. you know, but I thought I thought it was um, the, the, the settings were very apropos. Um, I mean, I think they worked very well. Um, and it wasn't like I was writing, um, you know, like verbatim, you know, like verbatim my experience. Like, for, for example, um, when I was over at Oxford, I was a student at St. Catherine's College. Um, at Oxford. Now, the, the, the girls, the witches, uh, the, the three witches are students at Christ Church. Um, so it's a different it's a different school. Um, it's a different one of the colleges. But still, my familiarity with it, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it worked. Um, mm-hmm. So. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I said it, you know, this is the way it came to me in the dream. And, you know, I, I'll be completely honest with you. I mean, there were some things that were tweaked. Um, it's not the dream verbatim. There was some things that I did alter around a little bit, change around. I think it worked out much better, much better that way. But, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, the, the actual template of, uh, the story of Pack with the Devil was this dream. And I'm sure that, you know, my, my experience is tied into the dream, I guess is the way I'm trying to answer it. Right. Yeah, that makes sense right there. I'm looking forward to the sequel already. I'm just telling you point blank. It sounds like, and I know I touched on this before, but it does sound like a screenplay or a film or something where it's going to expand. So I wish you the best of luck with this. I think it's going to be fabulous. Of course, all your books are incredible anyway, and we'll get into your other books tonight as well. But yeah, this is this is pretty cool. And I like the idea that you're um, you're going in different directions. You know, it's, it's nice to have something like this out just to see where it goes. And yeah. uh, 
you know, you just never know. Yeah, no, I, I, I was real happy with the way it came out. Um, it's my first work of fiction that I published. I've never promoted or marketed fiction before. So I'm kind of sitting back like, you know, like, like in the last three weeks since Thanksgiving, sitting back scratching my head, thinking to myself, well, gosh, you know, how, how can I really promote this thing? And I figure, well, I can always, you know, talk about the three other books and tie this in as well. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, that, that's a good thing, but yeah, no, I, I'm real happy with the way it came out. It, it, it has some controversial elements in it. So, you know, I mean, I think it could be made into a movie. It had to be toned down a little bit, um, but that's OK. And um, yeah, I, I just thought, you know, it, 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 it was like I said, what was fascinating with it for me was it wasn't really something I was planning on doing, but I was just taken with it. And uh, I, I liked it. And I liked it so much that, you know, I'm working on a sequel. I'm working on this backstory. Um, I'm actually I think we talked about this the last time I was on, but that's fine. I'm actually outlining cinema symbolism three um Mm -hmm. right now and i'm of course doing this other work of fiction and then uh, i think i mentioned this the last time i was there i'm actually being i I have been broached to do this other project this other book project that i'm working on um there's still some factors going on with that unfortunately i I, i'm bound by a non-disclosure on that so i can't get into that one at all right now Mm -hmm. um but yeah, no, um, as far as the other books are going, uh, Packed with the Devil's Out, so we can put that aside. I'm mm-hmm. currently writing this other one, this Black Flame story. I'm outlining the sequel to it, and uh, I'm still doing Cinema Symbolism 3 and tinkering around with this other uh, book of Freemasonry. But yes. I, I'm sure I'm sure the day's going to probably come shortly where I just sit down and concentrate on one more than the, more than the other. Um, the one that I'm, I probably am doing the most right now is uh, this backstory, this this tales from the black flame that I, I've kind of just seem, seems to have gravitated towards. It's one. There's one character in um, in a pact with the devil. It's an American witch, uh, and I, I, I for some reason I'm just I'm just sort of interested in her. Um, she's sort of like a wrecking ball character, like a Hannibal Lecter character almost. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just was really I was really taken by her. I find her very interesting. So uh, for whatever reason, I, I thought, oh, okay, you know. I thought let's give her more of a backstory. So um, I'm actually working on this one sort of black flame uh, backstory about how the, how she kind of came to be, uh, you know, her sort of rise to power. So that's what mm-hmm. I'm actually writing, outlining now. But I'm still doing Cinema Symbolism three and and the the Masonic book. They're, they're, those will definitely be coming out. Just kind of juggling four or five books at once. It's uh, not mm-hmm. easy to do, but it, it seems to always work out. Oh, yeah. Well, you're very talented. That's why. So you can multitask. That's very, yeah. very good. Yeah, I am looking forward to the cin- Cinema Symbolism 3. And, of course, we have the new Star Wars coming out pretty soon, don't we? So oh, yeah. uh, that should be interesting to see what your perception is on that one. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that will definitely be in Cinema Symbolism 3. Um, when I did, when I was doing um, Cinema Symbolism, the first one, I did the first six Star Wars movies. So this was four, five, and six, and then one, two, and three. And then when I was wrapping up um when, when i was doing cinema symbolism 2 this was when episode 7 came out and i just i just couldn't aco- incorporate it uh the book was all you know pretty much outlined or you know was being done written um and i, I it would have just gone on forever um i liked episode 7 uh it definitely has esoteric imagery in it um it definitely has some occult themes in it so mm-hmm. that this is something that's going to be definitely going into cinema symbolism 3 uh, no question about it. Rogue One, um, I like that. Um, that has some interesting aspects as well. That's something I'm going to be putting in Cinema Symbolism 3. And then, uh, yeah, there's Last Jedi. This comes out, wh- whatever it is, next week. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, I mean, if, if it's anything like Seven, uh, this should be, you know, definitely have some esoteric imagery. Of course, until I see it, I can't talk about it. Right. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, we'll see. Uh, if it's anything like the others, um, uh, you know, it, it should have some things in there. Uh, you know, all, all the Star Wars movies, um, have have something in it in more ways than one usually, and uh, it's certainly the way with Seven and Rogue One. So um, yeah, uh, when when Eight comes out, I'm most anxious to see it. And uh, you know, I like all the other Star Wars movies. So yeah, we'll see, and uh, we'll put this in uh, Cinema Symbolism Three, if the, assuming there's anything in there. But like I said, if it's anything like the other ones, uh, there should be no question about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it should be a very good film. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one as well. Well, I, I know we could dive into the Royal Arch of Enoch a little bit just because we haven't talked about it in a while. And I, I like people to um, kind of get refreshed insofar as your, your incredible sure. books and, and how they're such a good resource. And, and I, I, my, my biggest interest is um, the Ark of the Covenant and the correlation, if any, that it has to to the Masons. Well, absolutely. Yeah, this was uh, sure we could jump around to any any one of okay. my books. Um, cool. You know, you ask me anything you want. Um 
No, the Royal March of Enoch was my first um, book. Uh, this was originally published, as you correctly said, in 2012. Um, this has been republished by me um, it, it, in, 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 in the autumn of 2016. I formulated my own publishing house called Deadwood Publishing, um, and the book has been republished in print form and ebook form um, in, 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 uh, by Deadwood Publishing. And again, this is available everywhere right now. Um, this is on Barnes and Noble, Amazon, the Kindle, the ebook. This is all. 100% readily available. Uh, yeah, this was my first book. This was the product of 20 years of um, writing research. Just to give the listeners a brief background, then I'll answer your question. Uh, okay. The main thesis of this book was to present this uh, historical anomaly that was how this high degree Masonic ritual called the Royal Arch of Enoch um, was incorporating components and elements of the lost book of e e Enoch. This is Ethiopian Enoch, um, which was uh, discovered in was was rediscovered well was discovered by a man named James Bruce was reintroduced to Europe in 1771 and then translated to English in 1821 yet when this masonic ritual was being cultivated in the 1750s it was incorporating components of this lost book I, you know how could this be it's a historical anomaly um, and the ritual is very important because it's, it's a lot of the philosophies and the symbolisms coming out of this high degree ceremonial that the United States uh, of America is being cultivated around. Uh, you're absolutely right. There is a tie-in uh, with the Ark of the Covenant uh, with this. Um, the, 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 way it, the way it works is um, the, the, the ritual documents the, 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 this uh, rediscovery of this Masonic treasure vault in a subterranean crypt. Um, and on, the, the, the way the ritual goes is, you know, and the underlying philosophy of it is, um, the Jew, the Jewish people are in captivity in the Holy Land. A, a Persian emperor named Cyrus the Great dispatches a Jewish governor named Zorobabel, who, whose name literally means the path to Babylon, uh, back to the Holy Land to, to build the second temple. The Solomon's temple has been destroyed. The first temple has been destroyed to build the second temple. Um, and so they go to the Temple Mount and they're clearing away the rubble and they discover this hidden trap door in the ground. Um, and they spring the trap door open, and it's this subterranean treasure vault. Between nine arches um, in this subterranean treasure vault is this Masonic treasure, namely this lost word of a master mason. It's this secret name of God uh, that Hiram Abiff, the architect of Solomon's Temple, possessed. Um, and if you're, this ties into the Blue Lodge ritual. Hiram Abiff, when you go through the Blue Lodge ritual, Hiram Abiff is building Solomon's Temple. He has this secret word. It's the name of God, better known as the Tetragrammaton. Um, and it's through the correct pronunciation of this word that all wisdom, all learning is made possible. Um, and when they spring open this treasure vault, there's the Tetragrammaton. Um, and in between it are the two pillars of Enoch. And of course, on these pillars is this wisdom that Enoch has garnered. This is coming out of the book of Enoch. Uh, from his, you know, adventure travels in the afterlife, uh, interacting with this group of fallen demons known as the Watchers. So um, in the Ark of the Covenant in, in the ceremonial, uh, as it takes place um, in the in, in in the in the Scottish Rite, the Tetragrammaton is sitting on the foundation stone, which is the rock upon which the Ark of the Covenant once sat. Um, if, in the York Rite ritual, um, the Tetragrammaton is actually located on the Ark of the Covenant. Um, it's sitting on top of it. And of course, the Ark of the Covenant um, is, you know, the, the, this uh, treasure itself, which, you know, this box that contained the, you know, Ten Commandments and the, uh, um, the, the, the Staff of Moses and things like that. The, the, the whole idea behind this is, and this is the way it is in New York, right, is, um, is the, the Tetragrammaton, the name of God, is, is being invested with the divinity of the Ten Commandments, um, that it's from God, it's divine. Um, and thereby it's, it's investing masonry as the, uh, as, uh, you know, with, with Old Testament divinity um, of, that, of that. That's sort of the symbolic underlying philosophy of it. So, yeah, the Ark of the Covenant um, in, in, the, uh, in, in the ritual ceremonial does turn up. Um, and when you see the Ark of the Covenant, you'll, you'll see it uh, from time to time on Masonic documents or, or trestle boards. Um, or, you know, aprons even, um, or literature, it, it ties into this whole uh, ritual, this royal arch ceremonial, where the, the name of God is found in the subterranean treasure vault. And in the York Rite ritual, the Tetragrammaton is actually on the Ark of the Covenant. Um, so there is a tie-in with this in, in the ritual.
Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Yeah, I encourage everybody, if you haven't read his book, um, Royal Arch of Enoch, please do, because it's it's such a good read. And it's one of those books that you really need to read over and over again as well to absorb all the information because there's so much data there. So very, very interesting. Yeah, I've always been interested in that. Also, just out of just out of the blue, what is your take on the, the whole Jerusalem thing that's going on right now with um, Israel Israel's oh, capital? Moving, yeah, moving the, um, you know, they, they're moving the uh, embassy back. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Mm -hmm, um, right. I, I, I don't have a problem with it. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, Jerusalem is the capital. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's been that way since time and memorial. I mean, other presidents have promised to move it and never did. I personally right. don't, have a, I don't have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if there's any deeper symbolism with it. That's uh, what I was wondering if there was anything yeah, related. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, you know, if there's any sort of like hidden meaning to it or anything, I think it, time will have to tell um, to see if that plays out or anything. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. It's probably still two, three years away, I would think. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I personally have no problem with it. I think it's, you know, probably the right thing to do, uh, mm -hmm. you know. But, you know, we'll see what happens with it. I, I You know, it, it's still probably years away. Um, but we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, there maybe, you know, may, maybe it's some sort of prophecy or something like that. Um, I, I think it's interesting that the United States is doing it. Again, it, it ties in, you know, I guess on a symbolic level, for me, it ties into when I saw this was being done, the first thing I thought of was, you know, this whole idea of the United States being this, you know, Masonic Republic. And a lot of the, you know, Masonic symbolism comes out of the, you know, Bible and the Old Testament and the New Testament. I, I just couldn't help but think if it wasn't some sort of, uh, you know, I, Donald Trump is not a Freemason. I can mm -hmm. tell you that. Um, but, I, I, you know, it, it just is, it just always to me you know, is, is forming this nexus between masonry, the United States and, and the Bible and the biblical sites, which of course, a lot of the Masonic rituals circuit circle around, whether it be Solomon's temple, the second temple. I mean, this is all in Jerusalem. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, does it further invest, you know, the United States as a Masonic Republic? Yeah, I think it probably does. And I think it's interesting. And, uh, you know, I, I guess if there's symbolism to it, that could be it, how it plays out, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to say the least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Well, when you think about America and you all obviously know this, but it is true. We were founded on Masons to some degree. And I think that that signature is going to be with us forever. So it doesn't oh, surprise absolutely. me. Yeah. I mean, that's just something that's there. It's a very big imprint here in the United States, whether people want to acknowledge it or not. And, um, and that's one of the things I like about what you do is because people have so much superstition when it came to Masons and, and so much misperception and so far as what's really going on that they have to understand that there's, um, it's just phenomenal. I mean, there's, there's so much beauty associated with these teachings and also the symbolism behind it, especially with the architecture. So, uh, you know, the correlations between there and then of course Egypt and I can go on and on, but yeah, very, very fascinating. There's no doubt. So yeah, I kind of, I think it's interesting. We'll see what happens down the road there. So, um, yeah. Now I have another question also, you know, I was thinking about the um, the Jacob's ladder and and also the connection between I, I guess it's connected with the Pleiades to some degree or um, you talk about the Blue Lodge and, and kind of like the point between um, the goddess and the circle the four goddesses I don't right. know if you want to kind of go into uh, that yeah. a little bit right well there, there's a lot of in in masonry um, well for starters you're correct about the United States I mean whether it's the Constitution the triple division of government the Masonic architecture. I mean, one of the things that I really fleshed out in the Royal Arch of Enoch was, I mean, how much masonry has influenced and imprinted on the United States. I mean, I call it a Masonic Republic. I think that's a very apt statement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the triple division of government. I mean, the co I mean, you, you, it, it's everywhere when you really start to break this down. I mean, the, the, the templates of colleges and universities um, is, is based on Freemasonry. The, 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 the granddaddy of them all was uh, the, the, the aerial template of uh, Schenectady of New York, uh, of Union College of Schenectady in New York. We have the vaulted quadrangle with the domed building on top. This is the sun coming out of the vault of Enoch. Um, this is a long story, we won't have time to get into it, but that's Masonic. The Erie Canal, a lot of the state logos um, are Masonic. Of course, the architecture, the place like Washington, Baltimore, um, you know, you get into the monuments like uh, the Statue of Liberty and the George Washington Masonic Memorial. I mean, all these are reflecting you know, an echoing Freemasonry. I mean, the whole, the whole country is. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's this deep impression. I mean, and then again, a part of this is, um, you know, a lot of the Masonic teachings, a lot of the Masonic symbolism, um, we get into the whole, um, idea of Masonry. You know, I, I was on another show the other night, um, just talking about this where, 
Um, this comes out of the underlying philosophy of Masonry. Um, you know, is, is you, you read Masonic monitors and you're told Masonry comes from the seven liberal arts and sciences. This ties into the Royal Arch of Enoch ritual ceremonial. Um, the restorer of the seven liberal arts and sciences is a character known as Hermes Trismegistus. This is this Hellenistic Egyptian uh, god. He's a, he's a composite of three gods, the Egyptian Thoth, the uh, Greco-Roman uh, Hermes or Mercury. Um, and uh, in the Masonic lore, we have the subterranean treasure vault with these two pillars of Enoch. And, and in the underlying philosophy, before the Masons find it, these two other people breach the treasure vault um, and pronounce the correct and pronounce the um, tetragrammaton. The way it works is that Hermes Trismegistus goes down, pronounces the, pronounces the tetragrammaton and restores the wisdom on the seven liberal arts and sciences, Enochian pillar. And then Pythagoras goes down, the Greek mathematician, has his eureka moment in the vault of Enoch, uh, pronounces the tetragrammaton and restores the mathematical pillar back to mankind. So mm -hmm. Hermes Trismegistus is sort of the Masonic godfather. Um, and of course, he carries the Emerald Tablet with the Hermetic Maxim of as above, so below. So we have this, uh, this influence also with, with Masonry, this astrological, astronomical uh, influence with the alignments to the buildings. Um, yeah, you, you will find the, 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 the whole notion of Jacob's Ladder, the Ladder of Mithras um, in the Fellowcraft degree. This is echoed with the winding staircase to the um, of, of Solomon's Temple, um, where, where, the lib where you meditate on the seven liberal arts and sciences. Again, this ties into the Royal Arch of Enoch ritual. Um, but yeah, you, you, when, when you study um, the, the buildings of Washington, a, a lot of times, the, the cornerstone ceremonial ceremonial will take place um, on, on a specific day with astral significance. Um, the one that comes to mind um, right off the bat was the Supreme Court building. Uh, the cornerstone was laid um, on October 13th. Um, and of course, this is, uh, uh, you know, under the sign of Libra, uh, the great judicial scales, scales in the sky. So, of course, you want your Supreme Court building aligned to Libra. Um, the great, you know, the great, you know, scales of justice in the sky. Um, so it's things like that going on um, with it, you know, you know, and th this is all coming out of the teachings of Freemasonry, the Hermetic tradition, the Renaissance. You could even call it Kabbalah um, in, in a sense. So, yeah, I mean, this is this is a very deep study. And again, if you're interested in this, by all means, check out the uh, Royal Arch of Enoch book. Um, you know, th this was sort of the, um, you know, that I, I get into this, uh, this mm -hmm. whole Masonic history the symbolism in places like Washington, D.C. or Baltimore, um, you know, all the Masonic symbolisms, you know, the state seals, uh, the colleges. Um, you know, if you're interested in that, by all means, check out Royal Arch of Enoch. Um, you know, it's a 700 page book. And uh, this is where I really, you know, I mean, it was the product of uh, 20 years of research. So, I mean, you know, if you're interested in Masonic symbolism and esoteric imagery, by all means, check out that book. Uh, you'll love it. Right. Yeah, resource manual, that's what I call it, because that's what it is for me. And and I will say, um, for people who are listening, if, if you have any misperceptions at all about the Masons, you really need to read this book so you understand what's what what's going on. I, I mean, that's just my own impression, that people get misled. And this is really um, informative on so many different levels. As I said, you have to read it over and over because there's so much data there. It's interesting you talk about the Tetragrammaton, you know, the, this what what it comes down to to me or the way i see it is that it's all about the frequencies and the vibrations associated with certain strategic positioning whether it's through architecture or symbolism it's everything is representing a vibration or a sounding and that it's all correlating in alignment with the heavens is is that kind of a an alignment or yeah. no yeah i think i think that's a good way of putting it um i should point out that in the Masonic ritual, uh, the the tetragrammaton, the name of God, is purely done is purely ceremonial. Mm -hmm. um, it is not the actual name of God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I should I should make that clear. The the name that is used is one hundred percent ceremonial. Uh, mm -hmm. There is no Mason alive who thinks, oh, this is the actual name of God. Um, but it, it it is. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, when when you're dealing with um, this architecture and things like that, yeah, there's absolutely frequencies, vibrations, um, subconscious uh, conjuring of imagery. Um, we're dealing with, with, with masonry, a lot of um, solar imagery, a lot of astrological imagery, biblical imagery, esoteric imagery. Um, it, it's designed to impress on your subconscious mind. Um, when, when, you, when you become conscious of it, you'll be like, oh, aha, you know, now I understand why this building sits here and why the cornerstone was laid on this date and, you know, why, you know, you know, you'll find Hermes 
um, on, you know, around floating around the symbols, you know, the symbol of Hermes um, or even statues of him floating around mm-hmm. colleges or universities. I mean, a great example of this is, um, you know, we talked about it with a pact with the devil, um, Oxford University. Um, are arguably one of the greatest learning institutions of the world is overloaded with esoteric uh, Masonic uh, imagery coming out of the mystery schools. Uh, mm-hmm. For example, um, when you go in, well, you know, when well, I actually made it, uh, it, it made it into a pact with the devil. Uh, the girls wind up uh, walking right by it. When you walk into Christchurch, um, if you've ever been to Oxford University and you've been to Christchurch, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. When you walk into the great quad there, uh, Tom Quad, uh, this is their main quad at Christchurch. Um, you, you walk around, you won't find any Christian symbols. Um, you walk in and right in the center of it is this giant fountain featuring who else but Hermes Trismegistus. Mm. Um, and the reason for that is, is Hermes is the restorer in the Masonic ceremonial of the seven liberal arts and sciences. So it's a symbol of higher learning. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's right there at Christchurch. Um, you, Oxford University sits on the banks of the Thames, uh, but the, 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 the river's been renamed. Um, w- when you're at Oxford, the Thames is renamed the Isis River. And of course, Isis is the virgin mother of the sun, Horus. And this ties into your sacred feminine uh, Egyptian uh, symbolism, solar symbolism. The mm-hmm. Bodleian Library has a dome on it. Uh, the domed building is the sun god, Apollo or Horus. Um, and of course it's light, it's enlightenment. This is why you will new, would routinely find, uh, libraries with domes on it. This is the way it was set up in the United States with, uh, the library at Union College of Schenectady, New York was originally, and still does, it's called the Knot, uh, was supposed to have a, a, a it, what does has a dome on it. It's not a library anymore. It's like an admissions office, but it was originally planned as the library. And, uh, you know, the, the domed library at Oxford is the Bodleian and, uh, of course, this is uh, why the exclusive Masonic Lodge for Oxford University students is the Apollo Temple, uh, the sun god. Uh, and, and, you know, th- th- this imagery, you know, I mean, there it is. I mean, you know, plain as day. But, it, it, you know, it's there. But if you don't have the understanding of the mystery schools, the Egyptian symbolism, the, the Masonic influence, you know, it'll go by you. You, you won't mm-hmm. understand it. Right. Uh, you know, and this is, again, one of my motivations for writing this book. Um, and it's interesting, you know, this this turned up in a pact with the devil. The Christ Church is where these three women uh, go, go to school. And, of course, they wind up walk. I, of course, I couldn't help myself. I actually mentioned the Hermes Fountain. Uh, mm-hmm. They actually walked right by it at one point. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, you know, it, it's there. And uh, it's definitely there to throw out a frequency. The key is it's throwing it out is are you adept enough to pick it up and say, oh, aha, now I understand why it's there. And right. you know, like I said, you know, it's it's there. Um, you just got to be it, it's there. And it's influenced you subconsciously. But it's even more interesting when you become aware of it. And then you could say, oh, OK, now I understand it. Right. Exactly. Well, that's why I always wonder if some of these students out there, like the Oxford students, if they really know what kind of energies are around them insofar as the symbolism go. And, you know, some of these uh, it's just fascinating. You know, and to me, it seems like it would be a trigger to their subconscious if they were paying attention and and understanding what was going on. But I wonder from day to day how many people just get side sideswept, you know, and they just don't pay attention. But we had another question here in the chat. Um, sure. Let's see. Ask Robert, does he agree or not that Trump is the reincarnation of Cyrus from the Bible? Hmm. Uh, no, I don't believe that. I have no evidence to, to, I don't know who Donald Trump is, is reincarnated from. Um, if anybody, um, I, I would have <laughs> no, no, I've never ex- heard that one before. So no, I, don't I would know. have no expertise on who Donald Trump could, or if he even is reincarnated. Um, no, no idea. Um, okay. you know, I, you know, he, that would be, have, Trump would have to go to some sort of, you know, reincarnation expert, I suppose. <laughs> but, uh, no, I have, um, I have no, no opinion on uh, who or if Donald Trump is reincarnated from. Um, but just just to go back to what you were talking about. Yeah, I mean, well, just real quick. Yeah, when I was over there, I, I, I had no knowledge of this. I mean, it was just it was one of those things that just stood out to me, though. I remember thinking to myself when I walked into Christ Church uh, into the quad, oh, you know, why is this pagan God there? And then why is the Thames renamed the Isis River? Um, you know, and it was years later when I started putting it together when I was writing Royal Arch, thinking, okay, oh, now I understand this. You know, now I see, you know, why the Bodleian has the dome on it and why this is like that. And, and you, you, you'll be able to piece it together, um, you know, much more easily. Uh, my my album out of uh, Gettysburg, um, the, old, the old symbol was Hermes Trismegistus. 
Um, and Gettysburg at one time was one of the premier, and still is one of the premier seven liberal arts and sciences school. You know, and, and Hermes was on the uh, seal. Uh, and, you know, that, and that was a thing that, you know, it's like, oh, there he is again. You know, any if you got the eye for it, you always will find Hermes or Hermes Trismic just as floating around college campuses uh, and libraries. And the reason for that is coming out of this high Masonic high degree ceremonial, uh, the Royal Arch of Enoch. Um, but again, it's it's all your symbolic eye. It's all your frequency. Um, if you're not aware of it, you may, it may go right by you. But once you're tuned into it, oh, then you'll be able to start picking it up. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because sometimes some people would associate something like Hermes with, with the lesser gods or things that are more, I don't know if you'd call them entities, but I don't see them like that at all. I see that they're very symbolic and also that's a representation of, of um, well, to me, Hermes was the messenger, wasn't he? The messenger and the communicator to the gods or, or from the gods, if I'm not mistaken, but also, um, but yeah, to me, it seems like there's great, um, you know, if we look at things on a very ancient level, there's so much data in there um, that I think people do need to pay attention to that. And so far as what the initial message was behind these versus right. what I, people I, perceive the message. Yeah, I, absolutely. Well, Her Hermes ties in because he's, he's, he becomes a composite God. Mm -hmm. Um, he, 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 he's linked up with, um, in Hellenistic Egypt, he gets fused with the Greek, the, the Roman Mercury, I mean, the Greek Hermes and the Roman Mercury are the same thing, mm -hmm. but then he's fused with the Egyptian god Thoth, uh, and his full name is, uh, Thoth Hermes Mercurius Trismegistus, uh, the word Trismegistus means the thrice greatest, um, and yeah, he is this uh, very magical character, call him the godfather of magic, the godfather of Freemasonry. Um, you will often see Hermes by himself with the winged feet, you know, uh, mm -hmm. as an homage to Hermes Trismegistus, because it's, it's a concomitant. It's one and the same almost. Um, and uh, the, the, um, the, the, the character of uh, the god is the restorer of the seven liberal arts and sciences. And if you read Masonic literature, you'll find that masonry comes from the seven liberal arts and sciences. So he's sort of the god of magic. Um, he's the godfather of Freemasonry. Uh, this is the wizard archetype. Um, you know, the, 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 the god of magic. Um, you want to mm -hmm. see this character in film, um, look no further than Gandalf the Grey in Lord of the Rings, Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. Uh, this is, uh, of course, um, Albus Dumbledore in Harry Potter. This is the old graybeard wizard mm -hmm. figure. Um, I call it, I mean, it, I call it the Hermes Trismegistus archetype. I get to get no better way to carry it. I figured it's the magic figure. It's the wizard character who has all the information, only doles it out piecemeal. Um, so if you ever want to see Hermes Trismegistus on film, look for Albus Dumbledore, Gandalf, and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, there he is on film for all eyes to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's very good. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I wish you would, you don't do lectures, do you? I know you have your own um, work that you do with the Masons, but do you do presentations and lectures or sure. are you doing that at all? You do. I, I, do, okay. I do occasionally. Um, I do get invitations to, um, to lecture. There are fees involved with this. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if, 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 you know, it's, it's all, I mean, I, I can't guarantee it. Um, but if, if you were ever interested, I mean, what, you know, if you go to my website, um, there is contact information. If you were interested in having me as a lecturer, I have uh, given lectures. I've been invited. Um, I do do it from time to time. Um, a lot of times it's it's there's, of course, money involved um, and that can that can sour the deal um, sometimes. Um, but, you know, yeah, I mean, if you know, I'm, I'm always interested in giving a lecture. I, I've, been, I've given lectures to Masonic Lodges. Um, the last time I did one was uh, back in 2014. Um, I was invited up. Um, I was put up. It was very nice. And, um, you know, I certainly am not opposed to it, but there is expenses uh, when it comes mm -hmm. to this. But, um, you know, yeah, I mean, I mean, if, if you're interested, um, I, I was talk, I was contacted. I mean, I have contact information on my website. Um, it's I'm very easy to get in touch with. Um, I was invited just just to end up on this. Um, I was I was reached out to. I mean, I'm, I'm available for radio shows, for TV. Um, I mean, I get this all the time. Um, a, a Freemason reached out to me in California who publishes a Masonic magazine called Fraternal Review. I mean, heard me and said, we want we're doing a Masonic magazine here on Star Wars and Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. Would you like to participate? And I said, yeah. And, um, if you go to my website, it's called Fraternal Review Magazine. It, it's actually become very popular. Um, it's put out by the Southern California Research Lodge, uh, and their December, <coughs> excuse me, 17 issue um, is called uh, is is all about Freemasonry and Star Wars and the Force, um, and I had a Q and A in that. Um, so yeah, you you know you can check that out. Um, there's links Fantastic. to that on my website. 
yeah, you know, and, and check that out. So, yeah, I mean, I, I get invitations all the time to do stuff, radio shows. And uh, like I said, if you're listening, um, you know, and you have a radio show or whatever, what have you, um, I, I can't guarantee anything. But um, send me a con- send, you know, go to my website. There's contact information. Shoot me an email. And we'll see what happens. Excellent. Well, with that being said, we're going to have for a quick break, everybody. You're listening to Raven Stars Witching Hour. I'm your host, Solaris Blue Ribbon. My wonderful guest tonight is Robert Sullivan, the fourth. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. 